Well, good morning and welcome to River Church's online worship. I'm Pastor Randy Caulfield and I'm the lead pastor here at River Church. We will be meeting here in person in just a few hours, but I'm glad you're joining us online. We are producing uh, these worship videos every week because we understand that some of you are still sheltering at home and we respect that. I encourage you to follow your conscience. And so in an effort to bring you in and make you part of the body of Christ, uh, in order to be connected with you. We're doing these videos each and every week. Uh, so I, I invite you to get ready now. Uh, go get something to write with and uh, something to write on. Go get your Bible. Get, get rid of your distractions and maybe fill up your coffee cup. And uh, we'll, get, we'll get rolling here in a minute. If you have any questions about River Church, you can go to our website, uh, riverchurchrgv.com, riverchurchrgv.com. And um, most of your questions uh, can be answered there. At the end of this time, our time together, I'll tell you how you can get connected uh, with uh, us, the elders, uh, directly uh, via email. All right, well, let's get ready to worship. Today is week two of our study, The Great Exchange, a walk through the stories of the Bible. The Great Exchange, that's the phrase that I use to describe the gospel, the gospel story that is, that is woven throughout the the Bible from beginning to end. The great exchange is descriptive of how God interacts with humanity. The great exchange, we see it in the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. Now each week I try to give you an example of a great exchange that I've made in human terms. And so this week I'll tell you about something that happened to me in Albuquerque. I, uh, I raced bicycles and I had all the gear in, including these high-tech bicycle shoes. Yeah, they make those. Uh, and they were, they were awesome uh, and they were expensive uh, and they didn't fit my feet. They were a little too small so they really hurt but I didn't want to throw them away because they, I, they'd, I'd spent so much money on them. So one day I came upon a friend who had a load of motorcycle gear. I'm a motorcyclist as well. Uh, so I had uh, high-tech cycling shoes that didn't fit me, and he had a load of motorcycle gear that did fit me, so we made a great exchange, and, and I really was the beneficiary of that deal. Uh, I, was, I was really the winner. I came out the winner in that great exchange. But the great exchange that we're talking about in the Bible is the story of Jesus woven through every page of every chapter of every book. And so this is week two, and so we're going to look at a second example of the Great Exchange. We're still in the book of Genesis. And today we're going to look at a great uh, or a very well-known story in the Bible. Uh, it's the story of, a, of an animal dying in place of a little boy. The exchange of the animal's life for the life of a little boy. Now to understand this story, you have to understand a man named Abraham. You've heard of him. Let me remind you or tell you a little bit more about his story. In James chapter 2, this is this way into the New Testament now, right? This is thousands of years after Abraham lived and died. And this is now a testimony honoring who Abraham the man, the man was. And it says this, James 2. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. Imagine that the Bible records Abraham as being considered a friend of God. A very high esteemed honoring sort of title. But there's more that we should know about Abraham before we look at this familiar story. Uh, we should understand the fact that, that God made a promise to Abraham. The big word is a covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham. There are only a few men in the Bible that God made a covenant with. We'll talk about that in a minute. But one of them was Abraham. This Abraham, he's a special dude. Genesis 17 says, Behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be the father 
of a multitude of nations. This covenant that God makes with Abraham, he says, you, your offspring, uh, is going to be born out, uh, it's going to bear out uh, a number of nations. Now, God hasn't made that covenant with me, hasn't made that covenant with you, but he made that covenant with Abraham. Going on in verse uh, 21, it says this, but I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. Now what's going on here is, is God is saying, not through any of your other offspring, uh, not through any of your servants' children, but through this young boy who is yet to be born at that point, Isaac. It is through Isaac that I will make good on this covenant. And Genesis 21 verse 12 says this, For through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Okay, so now I need to give you even a bit more, kind of a back story, in order for you to understand the, the, the story we're about to, to read. So here's the back story. Abraham, the father of many nations, the, 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 the father of, of ultimately our Judeo-Christian um, beliefs, Abraham and his wife Sarah, they had waited for a lifetime for this promise, for this child. And they're now old people. They, they, they had waited. They, they had tried to, to, to figure it out themselves. They tried to do it their own way. You may remember this story. They, they couldn't have kids. They, 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 they just weren't getting pregnant. So, so what they decided was on their own, well, Abraham would sleep with Sarah's servant and then the servant would have a baby, and maybe that would be the child that, that God would, would bless them through. Well, that turned out to be a terrible idea. Uh, but ultimately, they learned to wait on the Lord. They tried it their own way. I've done that before as well. Tried it my own way. But ultimately, they learned to, to wait on the Lord. And then we pick up Genesis chapter 21. It says, The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah had bore him, Isaac. Finally, the little boy they'd been waiting for. So all is well. All is well with their little family until it isn't. Because God asks Abraham for the one thing that Abraham treasured most. Do you ever fear that God might do that in your life? That he might ask you for the, the one thing that you treasure most? I've contemplated that before. What is the one thing that I treasure above all else? And, and what if God were to ask that of me? All right, let's read the actual story now. Genesis chapter 22, the great exchange today, the, the life of an animal in the place of the life of a little boy. Genesis 22, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains on which I tell you. And in my mind, I can hear Abraham saying, okay, okay, God, you mean a, you mean a living sacrifice, right? Like a symbolic uh, living sacrifice. You're not asking me to. And, and, and he says, no, no, a burnt offering kill him and burn him on the, on, on, on the altar. Verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his, two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he uh, arose and went to the place of which God had 
told him Moriah. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Uh, then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and uh, laid it on Isaac, his son, that Isaac might carry it. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb? <laughs> Where's the lamb, dad? Where's the lamb for burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they, went, so they went, both of them together. When they had come to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid Isaac, his son, on the altar And on top of him, he put the wood, he put on him on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven. And the angel said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son, the ram in exchange for his son. So Abraham called the name of the place, quote, the Lord will provide. That's what he called it. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. I got to tell you, the first reaction that I have is shock. I mean, I take the stories of the Bible very seriously. And I think, how could God ask a man for the life of his son? And first, what I, what I want to point out, a real caution here. But I want to be very cautious here. First of all, this story, it's not a story we are to read as being a normal request that God would make of us. It's just not. Or that, or that God would, a request that God would ever make again of anyone except himself and his own son. Now, I, as, a, as a father, I, I shudder at the thought that God might ask this of me. But in reality, I, I, don't, I don't believe that that is the, the, I think that's a misapplication of this story. In fact, I, I don't think that is the point. Be like Abraham in this sense. In order to understand what Abraham does in uh, Genesis chapter 22, you have, to, you have to read his unusual faith story from chapters 12 um, through chapter 22. You have to look at the life and times of Abraham. His is a unique story. As I said, God made a covenant with uh, really four men in the Old Testament. Noah, Abraham, later on Moses, and then King David. King David. And their stories uh, are their stories. Um, they're not mine. Um, they're not your story. And if, if you were to come to me someday and you were to say, Pastor Randy, God has told me to kill someone. Uh, I'm going to say, hold on, hold, hold on just a minute. And I'm going to go and I'm going to dial 911 and I'm going I'm to call the authorities. Um, I just want you to know that. Uh, uh, this story isn't about that. This story is not calling us to that. That's not the point. What is the point? 
Really the point is that God is determined with this special man, Abraham, his servant, who he will write about in the Old Testament, he will write about in the New Testament, this special man whom God has made a covenant with, this special man that, that whose faith, whose faith is, is, is esteemed for 10 chapters at least in the Old Testament and, and spoken of in several books in the New Testament. God is determined in a very unique fashion to tell two stories or, or to send two messages rather through this story, this graphic story, this unusual story of Abraham. There are two things that God is trying to tell you today through Abraham's message. So the, the point is really twofold. What are they? Well, number one, the first point of this story, the first big idea is this. Jesus has died on the cross in your place. It's, it's beautiful, the parallel between this atrocious story of Abraham sacrificing his son, although he didn't ultimately, the great exchange happened. The parallel between that story and the story of what God has done through Jesus on the cross, it's just undeniable. This is, this is foreshadowing. God is saying early on in history, here's what I will do one day to save humankind. Jesus has died on the cross in our place. Let that sink in. Now, if we said, look, this is a completely irrational story by all standards, we'd say, yeah. Yeah, what Jesus, what God has done uh, through Jesus on the cross for us, by the world's standards, it's irrational. When I tell people of the story, the gospel story, the story of Jesus, some of them, they look at me like I've lost my mind. It takes deep faith and a life of, lifetime of seeing God's faithfulness to really, really grasp and really believe this story. Jesus has absorbed all of the wrath that God intended uh, originally for you. All of God's wrath righteously borne out because of my sin, and my rebellion. He placed that on Jesus. So, so God determined with Abraham's story thousands of years before Jesus came, God determined to foreshadow what he would ultimately do many years later in sending his son. He was going to sacrifice for our sakes. He was the sacrifice who died in our place, much like this ram who died in the place of little Isaac. The great exchange, the great exchange. A ram, the place of a little boy, a prophetic picture that God places in the story is this foreshadowing of what he will eventually do through Jesus' crucifixion. You remember John chapter 1, Jesus is actually described as a lamb. Um, John the Baptist sees him coming. He says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what we're talking about here, that he is the lamb that has died in our place. Here's the gospel story. We human beings, we need righteousness to be acceptable to God, but all we have is sin and brokenness. And we can't even, we can't even stand to be in God's presence because we're so broken and undeserving. All we have is sin. And, and all that God has is what we need, and that is righteousness. We don't deserve it, but we need it. And so, so, so what we have is what God hates and rejects, sin. And what God has is righteousness, what we need. And so what does he do? What is the answer? The answer is, is Jesus. Jesus died in our place. Jesus bore all of the condemnation that I rightly deserve, the great exchange. 2 Corinthians 5. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the story of Jesus 
in a nutshell. Now, I have some people say, yeah, like God really cares about our suffering. Like God really cares about our condemnation. He doesn't even fix the problems of the world. All this suffering, all this brokenness. And, and my, only, my only thoughtful answer to that perhaps is this, and I think it's a big answer, and that is God, God looked on human suffering and he was so concerned that he decided to enter into it to come in the form of Jesus Christ and to pay the penalty for our sin, to suffer in every way that we suffer, and yet he didn't deserve it because he was sinless. He is God. Back to Abraham. Abraham was just a man. Jesus is the hero of the Bible. Abraham was a good man, but he's just a man. He must have been so confused. You ever been there where like all you know is to hold on to the promises of God. That's all you've got. But you're so confused. That's Abraham. He's confused. He's disheartened. On this march up to the top of Mount Moriah. Surely he did not comprehend on that day. Hey, God's using me as an illustration. I'm going to be in millions of sermons for the rest of history. He wasn't thinking that. He's just thinking about his boy. He's not thinking, ah, God is painting this picture of saving faith. Painting this picture of what the sacrificial lamb really meant. And it's all, all, all Abraham could do to hold it together. Hold on at that moment to the promises of God. God has told me that this little boy is the ticket to the covenant. This, through this boy, Isaac, many nations will be born. God has promised me that. And he believed. We know that he believed that even if this son of mine dies, God will raise him from the dead. Hebrews eleven nineteen says that. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered, Abraham considered, that God was able even to raise him from the dead. From which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So, it's, it's kind of hard sometimes for me to be a little hard on Abraham, but, but the book of Hebrews tells us, no, Abraham was a man of faith to the degree that he said, God has made this promise. And, and, and God will fulfill his promise. So even if Isaac dies today, the Lord will raise him up again. The Lord will make good on his promise. So there's, there's two big ideas here uh, from this story in Abraham. I said that. Uh, one point is that Jesus has died on the cross in your place. We are to extrapolate that from this Abraham story. But the second big idea is this. God will, in your darkest day, provide for your need. God will provide a way out. He will meet your need. Maybe you're at a point in life right now where you have a deep need and all you know is to hold on to the promise of God which says that he will supply your needs he will meet your needs we have this story in the Bible to to encourage us to believe God meets you in your deepest need the Lord will provide Abraham in his darkest hour he looks up. There must have been shame. I mean, he's, 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 he's following as best he can the instructions he's received for the Lord, but he, he, I, I have to believe it. There must have been some sh shame. What am I doing here? Just, just torn emotionally. And all he can do is darkest hour, he looks up. And he sees God has provided a ram 
stuck in the bush, an animal, a sacrifice. I told my son God would provide a lamb. I told him he wouldn't, he did. Now my son will believe me. More importantly, my, my son will believe God. He will believe the promises of God. The Lord has provided. We read this verse. Let's read it again. Verse 14. So Abraham called the name of that place, quote, the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Let me ask you, friend. Does it seem as though in your life, maybe even at this very moment, that God is taking something away? You may, maybe it's in your heart, it's just like, oh, like it's, it's too much, God. You're asking too much of me. Oh, God, don't, don't take that. Are you at that point in your life right now? Maybe a person being taken out of your life, maybe a person moving away, maybe something lost that was dearly, that was dear and precious to you. I don't know what it might be. Home, a job, a relationship. Does it seem as though God is taking something away from you right now? Do you have faith to believe that he is the God who provides? In his weakness, all that Abraham could do was look up. And in his weakness, all that he needed to do was look up. Look, someday, and that may be today, Someday, you will need to trust that God will keep his promises, even when it looks like he won't. On that day, which maybe is today, you remember, the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. In your darkest hour, the Lord will make a way. Now let me ask you, what is the relationship between these two big ideas that, 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 that God is teaching us through this passage? The one big idea being that, that Jesus has died on the cross for you in your place and the righteousness of Christ has been placed on you. And the other big idea, big teaching here is that God will, in your darkest hour, make a way, provide for your need. What's the relationship? Is there a relationship? And I would say, yes, absolutely. There's a logic to this, which says, if God will do the hard thing, will he not also do the comparatively easy thing? Will he, can he not be trusted we looked at the passage last week, Romans 8, 32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give us every good thing? If we can trust God to do the hard thing, then we can trust him to make good on every other promise. So we can say right in the middle of my need, right in the middle of my darkest day, the Lord will provide. Now, you may, you may be asking, okay, Randy, what do I do with that? Where do I go from here? There, there may be shame. There may be fatigue. There may be a sense of, I can't go on. What do I do? I invite you this morning to simply look up. There's not anything that you can do. The Lord doesn't ask you in this faith process to do. He asks you to trust, to believe. Romans 4 says this, And to the one who does not work, there's no work to be done for your salvation. To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith, is counted as righteousness. 
in our fear, in our fatigue, in our inability to do anything to fix our brokenness, what we do is we believe. We simply place our faith in Jesus as the one who counts us as righteous. A lady once approached Jesus. She was at her lowest point. She'd been sick for 12 years. She'd been bleeding for 12 years and she'd gone to doctors. She'd gone to experts. No one could help her. She came to Jesus. She was at her lowest point. And Jesus spoke these words to her. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. The remedy that we need, the cure that we need, the medicine that we need is the faith to, to approach Jesus in humility and say, all I need is you. All I need is your healing hand. I invite you to come to Jesus today, my friends, that he might meet you at your low point, that he might meet you in your darkest day. The Lord will provide. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Amen. Well, that's a wrap. Um, I want you to know again that I'm just honored that you would invite me into your home and that you would take the time to worship with us uh, together today. If you have any questions, maybe you have a need, um, would you send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. Uh, Get some need that we, your elders, can help you with. If there's a way that we can pray for you, send me an email and, and uh, we, the elders, will respond uh, and we will help you uh, in any way that we can. If you want to get connected with a, a gospel community, that's what we call small groups or Bible studies, uh, there are several that are online. Uh, you don't have to meet in person in order to be a part of uh, one of our gospel communities. Uh, just go online, go to our website, and you'll see how you can get connected. It's also a good time to go online and give. Everything that we do here at River Church, all of our ministries are, are, are based on, uh, dependent on your financial, financial support. So I encourage you to go to our website and click that giving button. It's safe and intuitive and quick and easy. We couldn't open the doors. We couldn't keep the doors open. We couldn't minister in the ways that we do if it, if it were not for your uh, generous gifts. So... Um, and maybe some of you, maybe you've not given before. I encourage, I believe some of you out there today, like this will be your first time to give to River Church. And that's awesome. That's cool. Just go to the website and uh, click that button and you'll see how to do that. Well, I've enjoyed our time together, my friends. I love you guys and I'm praying for you. Have a good day.